Podcast. Today I am joined by Scott Ritter. Thank you so much, Scott, for coming back again for another conversation. Hopefully, great conversation. Well, thanks for having me. I'm, I have to admit I'm a little bit intimidated today because I saw your interview with Andre and uh, you, you, you set a very high bar, a very good interview, high quality interview. Now I'm nervous because will I be able to live up to your expectations? Oh, no, thank you, Scott. You know, I, I really, I feel sometimes like, how is this even happening? I'm talking to those great people and, you know, at first, I remember when we connected first time and I was really um, nervous because those topics were not something that I dealt with, you know, a lot. And it was even hard for me to express things. But with time, I hope I'm getting a little better for the audience too, so they can understand. <laughs> you're, you're, doing, you're doing just fine. So ready? Thank you. Here we go. Ready. Here we go. <laughs> Today, everyone, is a very special day in two places at the same time. And what I would like to say is this. On the 11th, 11th, in 1918, um, the agreement in, if I pronounce the city correct, campaign officially ended the First World War, also known as the Great War. Today, in Poland, we celebrate the National Independence Day. It's a very special day, especially this year, and I will record another video about it. Um, I never seen so many Polish flags on the street, like today. I never seen such a patriotic energy like I've seen today in different cities of Poland. But that's another story. And I will record the video about it, what was taking place. Also today in the United States, it's a very important day because it's Veterans Day. And as I came across this information that the US Census Bureau were saying that around 16.5 million veterans were in the United States last year in 2021. But we will get there with Scott in my last question. So I know Scott is very involved uh, with helping veterans and is very close to his heart. And there is one more day, Scott told me, that was yesterday. What was this day yesterday, Scott? 247th birthday of the United States Marine Corps, which I know for everybody else, it's a ho-hum. For the Marines, it's, uh, it's a big deal. Uh, it's Marines, uh, I mean, half the battle in, 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 in any sort of conflict is um, being convinced that you can win. I mean, it's, it's it, war is as much psychological as it is physical. Um, if, you, if you don't have a winning spirit, you, you can't prevail on the battlefield. Marines don't lose because we can't lose, because we are brainwashed in, in training from the very beginning uh, into believing that um, we will never disgrace the Marine Corps, we will never disgrace the, uh, the memories of those who have gone before us, uh, that the Marine Corps is, um, is, is literally bigger than life. Um, and, you know, we leave the Marine Corps for various reasons, but it's always with us. And on, uh, on this day, uh, Marines, wherever they are in the world, uh, we, we gather um, and we, we read the birthday message from the Commandant, and then we uh, celebrate by uh, cutting a cake. Um, and I've been in uh, places where there's only two Marines, me, we and, me and another Marine. And uh, the oldest Marine cuts the cake for the youngest Marine and serves in the first slice. And uh, it's just tradition. And uh, so yesterday we celebrated our birthday. Um, it was a big deal for, for Marines everywhere. Um, and, and what I would say about this is a lot of people are like, hey, man, you're like uh, Mr. Anti-War now. Uh, and yet you celebrate the Marine Corps birthday. You're damn right I do. I celebrate the Marine Corps birthday. I'm proud of who I am. I'm proud of what I did. I'm proud of what I was. Uh, but you know what kind of birthday I want to celebrate? I want to celebrate with... Marines, where we don't have to give toasts to those who fall, who fell. I want to make sure that the Lance Corporal who cuts the cake today is the gunnery sergeant 10 years from now. And I would prefer that he not have any campaign ribbons on his chest. I would prefer that he had a 20 year career where all he did is prepare for war and never have to fight war. That's the best Marine Corps birthday imaginable, where all Marines get to participate, where there are no empty chairs at the table, where there are no empty spots in our hearts where everybody is alive and well and living, uh, celebrating our, our past and hopefully celebrating a peaceful future. 
So yeah, I celebrate the Marine Corps birthday, uh, but it, it's, it's one that I want to celebrate with all Marines in perpetuity, meaning let's not have any more wars. Let's not have any more Marines die. Mm -hmm. Let's make Marines the best force and preparation the world could ever have and hopefully never use. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Very important um, to, to mention this. And I have to admit, I didn't know that yesterday was that day. But let's get into my questions. Like I showed you before the interview, everyone, this is next level. So we are stretching this uh, here <laughs> on my paper as well. And what I would like to start with is this. This is what I have written from my observation. So considering the lack of rush in this special military operation and the simultaneous advance of Russian troops with occasional withdrawals, I have this impression that Russia might win this conflict economically before it wins it militarily. So as Europe and Ukraine hit the bottom energetically and economically, Russia is strengthening relations with the rest of the world and perhaps is even going to introduce a new monetary system uh, within BRICS soon. So do you think, Scott, that Russia will win this conflict first economically and then militarily or it will be in reverse orders? I think there's a synergism. You've definitely hit on the fact there's just a synergism between the two. I mean, let's, let's be clear here. Um, one of the, possibly the only thing that gives Ukraine military relevance at this point in the conflict is the tens of billions of dollars in assistance that's been provided by NATO and the United States. Without that assistance, I think the Ukrainian military would have been defeated this past summer and um, the military part of this campaign would be coming to a close. Um, the military assistance being provided however, is not a bottomless pit. It, it, it's linked to uh, an American economy and a European economy that's struggling. And um, already we see signs that there is a Ukraine fatigue, both in the United States and in, in Europe. Um, is this Ukraine fatigue something that Russia would like to promote? Now, now we have a problem here because the the immediate answer is yes of course russia would promote this ukraine fatigue because it benefits that it gets cut off but people tend to forget that before we had the special military operation we had russia saying we want a new european security framework that's the most important thing to us and that in order to achieve this we need to sit down with nato and the united states and discuss this in a manner that both that the interests of both parties are recognized. If this war is allowed to conclude in a total Russian victory, total complete Russian victory, economically and militarily, um, I think you create a difficult situation for Europe to buy into a new European security framework because they're gonna feel very vulnerable. They're gonna feel exposed, they're gonna feel weak. And um, the, the, anybody who thinks that this is going to lead to European collapse, um, it may not. I mean, one of the dangers of heading down a, a path that's never been headed down before, because when was the last time we talked about the collapse of the European Union? Not since the Eurozone was created, um, but now it's, it's there. Do we know what's gonna come out on the other end? And the answer is no. We don't know what's gonna happen. Germany collapses. Will uh, the German right wing be empowered? Will it give birth to a new national socialist ideal, um, a new German nationalism that's independent of the Eurozone, promoting the Aryan race? Where have we heard this before? So, you know, if, if I'm a Russian, I'm sitting there going, you know, we know Europe right now. It's not perfect. <laughs> we know it's not perfect. It causes us a big headache, but we can manage this problem. We can work with this. We can shape it. We can sit down at the table and create this new European security framework. So I think that Russia, I think the most important for, thing for Russia is to emerge from the special military operation um, in a manner that promotes dialogue 
not makes okay. dialogue impossible. So I think Russia is going to manage the economic uh, aspect of this conflict as well, uh, not to encourage the total collapse of Europe, but to manage this crisis so that the, the, the known aspect of Europe is retained, survives. Because uh, there's a lot Russia could do to just immediately undercut Europe. I mean, let's look at one one thing they could do. We, we, we talk about the energy all the time. If Russia was really interested in cutting off Europe, why are they promoting Turk Stream? Why are they allowing the Turks to create a new energy security hub or energy hub that provides uh, Russian gas to, uh, to Europe via the south as opposed to the north? Um, another thing that Russia could do instantaneously is just stop co cooperating with the uh, grain. Uh, deal out of uh, out, out of Ukraine. Why? Yeah. Not that Europe will starve. It's the prices will go through the roof. Look at England. England doesn't buy any grain from either Ukraine or Russia. No grain is delivered there. And yet, when Russia threatened to pull out of the agreement because of the drone attack against the Black Sea Fleet, prices, food prices around the world spiked, and suddenly England was in a position where they couldn't afford food. <laughs> If you're one of these people who thinks that Russia should use all the tools at its power, right there, you can starve. You can you can price Europe out of existence with a food crisis that's created by spiking food prices so high that Europeans can't afford to buy the food they need from global source. Yet Russia's not doing that. Russia's not doing that. Why? Because I don't think it's in Russia's interest to have Europe collapse. I think it's in Russia's interest to keep this system that they know so that they can sit mm -hmm. down with them in a post-Ukraine conflict and work out in an amicable and mutually beneficial manner a new European security framework. Um, Macron is a pain in the you-know-what. Everybody agrees. And yet Macron is one of the few European leaders that talked about the importance of an independent uh, European foreign policy and uh, the need for a European security framework that respects European security interests more than they respect American security interests. Uh, so why would Russia want to get rid of that? Yeah, well, he provides our howitzers to the Ukrainians. So what? We can destroy the howitzers, but we can't guarantee that a French leader that replaces Macron is going to have that same approach. Um, they, they might become more nationalistic, or they might become more pro-American. Here we have a guy talking about an independent European foreign policy. We Russia should seek to promote that. So I think there's a lot of complexity in this foreign policy and economic uh, scenario uh -huh. that many people don't realize because a lot of people look at it from the short term. What would benefit Russia the most in the short term? Cutting off energy and cutting off soup food supplies, destroying the European economy would definitely benefit Russia in the short term. But in the long term, it's, it's bigger than winning in Ukraine. So Russia's in a situation right now where they're awaiting the, um, the, the, the final preparation of around 200,000 troops. That's 10 to 15 divisions. Okay, and so you jump, can I, you're jumping to my second question. Perfect. This is exactly. So I, I just want to ask it so you can continue because this sure, is sure, exactly sure, sure, sure. where you're going. <laughs> so over these 200,000 Russian troops from the partial mobilization might be joining the special military operation now. When do you think this will happen? How, in your opinion, this might unfold and what will be the consequence of it? Okay. Um, well, I mean, it's going to happen when it's ready. That's the important thing. I mean, I am an independent observer. I take a look at what should happen logically when you bring in reservists. You have to make sure they have the skill sets. Because what, what's happened so far is about 80,000 reservists have been trained and then deployed to the front where they're absorbed by existing units. So they went through the skill set training. If you're an infantryman, they made sure you knew how to do the basic infantry skills. But then they turned you over to an existing unit where you integrated yourself into an, you know, existing formations at the platoon level, company level, et cetera. Um, that could happen relatively seamlessly. Uh, but now, if you take the rest, um, you know, 200 plus thousand troops, the idea is to organize them into motorized rifle divisions or uh, tank divisions. Um, 
this means you have to train them on the skill sets. So they have the individual skill capabilities. Mm -hmm. Then you have to bring them together first in tactical units. They have to learn to fight as a platoon. They're not joining a platoon that's already in existence. They're creating an all new platoon. So they have to work together as a platoon. Then they have to put them in a company and work as a company. Then they have to put them in a battalion and work as a battalion. Then they have to have the battalions work together as a regiment. Then they have to have the regiments work together as a division. And these are all different levels that have to be trained and, 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 and organized and prepared for. Um, and it takes time. So they're in the process right now of organizing these 200,000 into these units, cohesive combat units. And when they pass their final exam, which would be at the division level, uh, they will be deemed either to be combat ready or not combat ready. If they're combat ready, they'll be turned over to uh, General Armageddon, General Suraviking, and he will use them per the plan, whatever the plan is he's come up with. Um, if they're not combat ready, then they'll be recycled to make sure that the deficiencies that were identified are rectified before they be sent to the front. When I look at, you know, what logically should go through, you know, you go through and, and, and look at prior history of what it takes to train a Russian uh, motorized rifle division, um, et cetera. I believe that uh, these guys will be ready sometime by the end of this. So at about a month. The end of, sorry, can you say I didn't December, hear? December. This year? Yeah. Um, and so I, okay. I, believe, I believe you'll st be starting to see formations uh, flowing in that direction. Now, 200,000 people, mm -hmm. if they're all being organized into divisions, you know, the average, you know, Russian division is what, 10,000, 12,000? So we're talking 10 to 15 divisions. Um, that's a lot, by the way. That's a lot of, a lot of troops. Um, that gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of, you know, attack, uh, more than defend. Right now, the, and here's the thing people have to understand. I, I, I got this point, somebody pointed this out the other day. Scott, you keep saying that uh, Odessa is going to be taken by the Russians, but they just retreated from Kherson. And hey, yeah, that means they're never going to take Odessa. Like, no, that's not what it means at all. Oh, yeah, it does, because you said they were going to take it. Now they retreated. I said, well, I think the general, because it doesn't matter what Scott Ritter says. For example, it matters what the general says. And the general said back in October 16th that it was a very tense situation at Kherson. Mm -hmm. Very tense. And he said he would be called upon to make some very difficult uh, decisions in the near future. One of the things that the, a term that has been used over and over again by the Russian authorities is that there was an unstable situation in the SMO, in the Special Military uh, Operations Zone of Operations, brought on by insufficient resources. Remember, we talked about this. They didn't have enough people for the job. They had thousand kilometer frontage and only thirty to sixty guys per kilometer, and um, you you know that was a problem. Mm -hmm. So. Just because the general came in doesn't mean the problems are solved. It means the general needs to solve the problems. And so he's done that by taking these 80,000 troops and plugging in the holes. Instead of having a hard point and a hard point here with a big gap that you're going to cover with artillery, he's made a continuous defensive line still covered with artillery. Um, so now the Ukrainians can't just run through a gap. The Ukrainians now hit a defensive line where they get pummeled by artillery and they get pushed back. And that's what's been happening all over the front. But it's still a tense situation. It's a difficult situation. Made more difficult in Kherson because you have a significant number of troops, 30,000, on the, I guess they call it the left side of the, of the Dnieper, the western side of the Dnieper River, uh, at a time when all the bridges that connecting the, 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 the two banks have been destroyed. All that's left is pontoon bridges. And those pontoon bridges are continuously being attacked by Ukrainian artillery, uh, which makes resupply difficult. Now, the Russians there aren't getting beat. As the general said, they killed or wounded 12,000 Ukrainians in the month of October alone. That's a casualty rate of seven to eight times what the Russians lost, which means the Russians lost between 1,300, 1,500 troops. That's a lot, not like what the Ukrainians lost. The Russians were winning the tactical battle. The problem comes in sustaining that and preventing additional loss. The Russian artillery, which is a very important part of their of their, you know, of their approach to war, on the you know on the West Bank, um, was not able to be resupplied 
uh, sufficiently so they could sustain the rate of fires necessary mm -hmm. for to, to achieve that outcome. Uh, that means if they're not suppressing Ukrainian fire, then the Ukrainians are able to increase the amount of accurate fire on the Russian positions, killing a lot more Russians, destroying Russian equipment. That doesn't mean the Russians are losing, but it means Russians are going to die in a higher rate of casualties than makes sense. Because now, why is Russia on the West Bank of the Dnieper? Why? What is the purpose of these troops right now? Ostensibly, it's because it provides a bridgehead for any potential continued offensive operations to take Nikolaev and then pivot and take Odessa. So that makes sense. But Russia can't do that right now because they don't have the troops available. They're being trained. So now you have all these troops in a potential springboard bridgehead who are sitting still getting pounded by Ukrainian artillery. Yes, they're giving better than they take, but they're dying. Now you're a general saying, what's the most precious resource I have? my men. So I'm going to leave my men in this exposed position so they can die heroically? That's called stupid. Why don't we instead bring them back to this side of the river, consolidate the defensive lines, and pound the Ukrainians to death with our artillery now that doesn't have to worry about being interdicted by Ukrainian artillery, and, and stabilize the battlefield? And that's what he just said to the, uh, to the situation in the SMO has become stabilized. For the first time now, all the retreats and everything, the reinforcement of 80,000, they've stabilized the lines and they've stabilized even further by doing this withdrawal in Kherson. Now you're stable. Ukraine is going to do what? Beat their head against a wall still? Lose thousands more still? I mean, guess that, that that's the short answer. Um, the Russians, by the way, continue to be the, on the offensive in the, in the area of Donetsk. Continue to take, you know, Bakhmut is in, uh, on the verge of falling. Other uh, critical uh, places are about to fall. And when that happens, they've pierced the Ukrainian defenses and they're in a position to exploit, except what? They don't have sufficient troops because the mobilization has not been completed. So the Russians are stabilizing the line, stabilizing the line, preparing for exploitation. And when the troops come, I will bet a dime to a dollar that you're going to see significant offensive operations carried out by these 200,000 troops that will be decisive on the on the battlefield. Whether it will, you know, sweep south, take mm -hmm. Nikolaev and on to Odessa, or it will sweep north and take Kharkov, that's a decision the Russian high command gets to make, not me. But the Russians will have that potential. Meanwhile, the Ukrainians, they burn through all their re reserves. Um, you know, yes, the consolidation of the battlefield in Kherson will allow the Ukrainians to release, you know, 20 to 30,000 troops that can be brought in elsewhere. So, you know, the battle will be waged. But it doesn't change the tactical imbalance, the fact that the Russians have a superior approach to combat when they have sufficient resources allocated that's artillery intensive. And these Ukrainian troops will be ground down and killed without any significant uh, achievements to their name. Um, it's all going to come down to the 200,000 troops and, and the timing of that. Now that comes back to the economic. So mm -hmm. we're in a situation now where Russia has to manage the, because the, Russia wants to keep the pressure on Europe. Don't, be, don't, don't think that Russia doesn't want pressure on Europe because the pressure on Europe can translate into reduced support for Ukraine, but they don't want Europe to collapse. So now Russia has to diplomatically manage the pressure on Europe, also means managing the US problem, um, while getting ready to escalate the military. So you're, you're managing, preparing to escalate. And then once the military campaign starts, there's gonna be a, the, the whole issue of how to not alienate Europe. Europe and the United States need a soft landing here. They're going to lose. Do you want them to crash and burn? Or do you want them to come in for a soft landing? I believe that the Russians want the soft landing. Because then the soft landing, they all get to walk away from the aircraft, come to the negotiating table. They're faced with the, you know, the, the finality of a Russian military victory in Ukraine. And yet Russia is willing to talk about a new European security framework where the interests of both parties are uh, considered. What does soft landing really looks like? 
Well, first of all, the soft landing um, preserves the existing political and economic elite structures. Um, I've been someone who said that if this is allowed to go out of control, you're going to see revolutionary transformation in Europe that will see these uh, these elites evicted. Uh, for, and, and, and things may have progressed too far for that, you know, for that not to take place. I can tell you right now, left to their own devices, you know, some of these European governments won't survive the winter. Mm -hmm. I agree. But, but if Russia manages the problem, for instance, the, the G20, it's important, I think, that Putin's not going to the G20. People say, well, why? Why? Because the Russians are smarter than the average bear. I mean, they, they really are just, <laughs> they think things through. Well, Putin could go to the G20 and get, and seize headlines and have some propaganda victories. His presence will be disruptive, 100% disruptive. And all they'll be talking about is his presence, who's going to be in the room when he's in the room, who's going to meet with him, who's not going to meet with him. Uh, Zelensky won't come. This won't happen. This won't happen. That. What does that accomplish? Nothing. But if you're the Russians and you say, hey, it's very important for us to manage this food crisis, this, 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 this problem of food supply right now, um, and we have uh, the agreement expiring, uh, I think, on November 19th, and we're meeting at the G20, uh, where we want to negotiate, uh, you know, a, a broader food supply solution, wouldn't it be better just to send Lavrov and let Lavrov meet with people and, and, and put these things out? Um, and I think that's what they're doing. I think they're, they're trying to use the G20 meeting not to be a disruptive power. And again, it's in one would think it would be in Russia's interest to disrupt the G20. Why? Because Russia's promoting the BRICS. And so why would you empower the G20, which is just an expanded version of the G7, that takes G7 policies and tries to be lighter, mm -hmm. while you're promoting the BRICS? Well, what happens when you subtract the G7 from the G20? You get BRICS. <laughs> and so Russia is working with BRICS. They're just doing it in a different way. Uh, the Russians are just cleverer than anybody else at the table. Um, you know, I mean, Chinese are clever too. I don't mean that, but I'm talking about anybody of, the, of their opponents. I think Russia and China are going to go into the G20 meeting and they're going to seek to be seen as working as responsible global citizens with the global community, inclusive of those people who are unfriendly to Russia to try and solve some of the pressing global problems. Um, and that's how you get a soft landing. You get a soft landing by Russia not being stupid, by Russia not playing childish games, by Russia working to ensure that Nobody suffers needlessly. Um, that it's not in Russia's interest to see Europe, Europe collapse. And, and, and there was an inter interesting article that I read, uh, and, and it was people were criticizing me because they're saying, and again, I'm not above criticism, man. I'm, I'm just a Marine talking. Um, if you don't like what I say, I'll listen. And sometimes, you know what? You're right. Uh, they, were, they were saying that, um, uh, boy, I just lost my train of thought. They, they were they were basically saying that um, I'll have to come back. That that, that happened. It's okay. But it's the, okay. The, the point is that the, there was a soft landing. Um, I think Russia is going to try and and, and and promote that over total victory. Uh, that it does. It's not. It's not in Russia's interest to have total victory. It's in Russia's interest because total victory is what a global hegemon seeks. That's what America seeks. When we confront you, we want, to, we want to destroy you. We want to win totally. We want to dominate. We want to impose. Russia's not looking for that. Russia's looking to be part of a global community. Russia is fighting to get a seat at the table, not to be the head of the table, a seat at the table, but to be heard. And that's a different approach. But in the West, when we look at the Russians, we often mirror image our approach onto their actions, and we assume outcomes that the Russians aren't trying to uh, trying to achieve. Scott, what is going on with the civilians in that Kherson region? Um, as I understand, there has been evacuation going on. Um, but what does it really mean at this point? There are still people living there. And how how is the situation with civilians in that region? I would like to know. Well, remember the of the four districts that um, voted for uh, in, in the referendum, uh, 
Kherson had the lowest numbers of uh, people voting in favor of uh, annexation, um, which means, I mean, let's just put it this way. Let's say 100,000 people voted. We know it's more than that. But let's say 87% voted. That's, you know, marine math, uh, 13% that said no. So that means 13,000 didn't, didn't vote in favor of it. Now you take the, the population of, say, 400,000. Now you got 52,000 people that didn't vote for it. Um, so now they're given the option, leave, go to Russia, or remain, and the Ukrainians are coming. The people that didn't want to be part of Russia are like, I'm staying. I'm staying. Now, people are looking at that saying, oh, the Russians abandoned them. Um, look, no evacuation under pressure is ever perfect. And I'm positive that you will find examples of the families that were left behind. You know, the people that woke up and said, oh, my God, the Russians are gone. I didn't know this was happening. How could that be? Well, it wasn't because the Russians didn't try. <laughs> the Russians made it known. They've been working. Sarah Viking began evacuating back in October 14, 15, 16. That's when the evacuation began. As soon as he took command, he said, get them out. And they've been evacuating civilians ever since. And I don't, you know, the total numbers, I don't know. It's, uh, I've, I've seen between 150, 200,000 people evacuated. Um, you know, in addition to that, we, we're looking at, you know, 30,000 Russian troops. 5,000 pieces of heavy equipment. They aren't abandoning their tanks, abandoning their artillery. It was an orderly withdrawal of people. And they didn't just take people. They brought belongings. They brought the archives. They brought things of cultural interest uh, to preserve it and bring it back, um, which tells me they plan on going back to Kherson. They aren't surrendering Kherson. They're just it's a temporary battlefield adjustment. But there are people who stayed behind who are pro-Ukrainian. I mean, that was clear in the uh, referendum, that there are pro-Ukrainian segments of that population. They stayed behind, and they're giving the Ukrainian troops a hero's welcome. Okay, and here's the question I never asked you before, and I felt compelled to ask you this today. While we are, while we are looking at the Ukraine situation, there is a lot going on with Iran. Scott, can you explain to us? Because I think it's something very important that we should pay more attention to. What's going on in Iran right now? All right, we got to pull back and look big picture. Uh, since the Iranian revolution of 1978, 1979, that ousted uh, uh, Reza Shah Pahlavi, the monarch, um, and replaced him with this theocracy initially headed by um, you know, Ruhollah Khomeini, um, Ayatollah, Grand Ayatollah. Um, the United States has been in opposition to this regime. They've been seeking to remove it from power. Uh, a, a lot of our hatred towards this regime is fueled uh, not only by the fact that they got rid of a longtime ally and our CIA failed to predict it. It was a very embarrassing moment for the United States to suddenly have this ally gone. And Jimmy Carter, looked, who was president at the time, looked impotent uh, in the face of the Iranian revolution. But then, um, you know, radical storm, the U.S. Embassy took Americans hostage, held them for 444 days, uh, humiliating the United States in the process. We get a rescue mission. Uh, it failed. We left 13 bodies, or maybe eight bodies on the on the desert floor, burned, abandoned, along with the airplanes. Uh, the, the, the Ayatollahs, some of them were poking the bodies, mocking them. And for an American long distance, you're just a hate this feeling, the hate this feeling. So the American people have been trained to hate Iran for some time now. And when you hate somebody, you don't really want to know them. You don't want to understand them. You don't want to know anything about them. So there's a perception in the United States. It's automatically inclined to think worst possible things about Iran. Um, just a quick thing. I, I, I traveled to Iran in 2007. Um, and it, I was researching a book on the Iranian nuclear program. Um, and the, the Iran I experienced was far different than the Iran I was expecting. I was expecting I don't know what I was expecting, but it wasn't what I got. I got a modern state full of very vibrant people. Uh, yes, women wore the hijab, but many of the women were rather liberated. They all drove. They're very intelligent. Uh, they weren't this uh, subordinate class of people. They were out there, you know, proudly representing themselves. Um, the, the, the majority of the people were extraordinarily friendly, well-educated. Even when they found out I was an American, they were welcoming. Um, it was stunning. It was clean. It was modern. Um, it wasn't perfect, but it was, you know, I mean, it was 
it was functioning quite well. Um, Eye-opening experience to me. Did you stay there a long time, Scott? How long no, was, was this? I was there for a week. I was there okay. For a week. Okay. Uh, I would have liked to stay longer, but money is always a, a, an issue when you're funding your own travel. So uh, you know, that was not possible. Um, but I bring that up because in 2009, I believe, um, there was a presidential election. I think it was the re-election of uh, Ahmadinejad, uh, had been the president of, uh, of Iran. He got re-elected. Um, but the election was um, was a, a controversial one, contentious, uh, and there were allegations that he um, suppressed the opposition participation. So something occurred called the Green Revolution, uh, and people went into the streets to pro protest this outcome, and it led to some rioting and some violence and, and things of that nature. And on the surface, it looked as if this was a popular revolt against, um, against the Iranian government. But as soon as you start parsing it down, yes, you find there are elements of genuine dissent. Let's be clear. When the Shah left, there was a large percentage of the Iranian population that was pro-Shah and anti-theocracy. And they still exist today. The business class, the educated class, I mean, the, 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 the educated elite. And they're concentrated in places like northern Tehran, which is a stronghold of anti uh, theocratic pro-Western, um, you know, champions. Um, and so there is a significant pop percentage of the population who are vehemently opposed and their, their participation in a demonstration protesting what they believe to be the, um, inequities of, of, of the election was legitimate, but then there are other people going out there who didn't share their, the, the legitimate roots. These were people that were empowered by foreign intelligence services to create, to promote unrest. It's, it's, it's something we saw later in Syria with these so-called uh, community groups that were given um, you know, smartphones and, and the ability to videotape and transmit videotape um, abroad, which could be used by the media to promote a perception and a narrative about what's going on that maybe deviates from what's really going on. And that's what these people, it's called the digital, it's called digital democracy. It's promoted by the State Department as a regime change tool. The idea is through digital democracy, you have these young activists who are going to film things in isolation, you know, and, and look, are the Iranian security forces capable of brutality? Yeah, of course they are. Is the Seattle Police Department capable of brutality? Uh-huh. New York Police Department? Uh-huh any police department's capable of brutality. And if all I do is film the acts of brutality, I can shape a narrative that says, this is a brutal regime. So that's what they were doing, shaping it out there uh, and, 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 uh, and promoting this dissent. It, it didn't work because at the end of the day, the theocracy is far more entrenched and far stronger and has far more loyalty than many people in the West, A, know about or are willing to accept. What's happening today is similar to what happened in 2009. There was an incident. There was a, I think, 22-year-old Kurdish girl uh, who was um, arrested for failure to wear the hijab properly. And she was summoned by the morality police to a police station. Um, according to the videotape, and it, I, I have to assume that it's the truth, I don't know, because how do I know? Uh, she was being talked to by a uh, Iranian, by a, one of the morality police who opened up the hijab, was pointing out that things were wrong. And then, but there was no physical outcome. They didn't punch, they didn't kick, they didn't do anything. And then she suddenly collapsed and fell headfirst into a chair, collapsed. And then the Iranians tried to revive her. They called an ambulance. She was transported to the hospital where she was pronounced dead. But by hitting that table, there were some facial injuries. And this turned into, she was beaten to death at the police station. That's the story that was put out there. And this caused a lot of Iranian women to rise up and protest. I believe the roots of the protest are legitimate. I'm not a female, but I can tell you that um, if I were, I wouldn't want anybody to tell me how to dress, you know, and and, and stuff. And I would take umbrage at uh, these restrictive controls and et cetera. And so they're out there, they're cutting their hair, they're doing the protests and uh, and such. People jumped on that bandwagon. Uh, we're talking about the monarchists. Um, we're talking about the uh, Mujahideen, uh, uh, Mujahideen, uh, uh, the um, the, 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 the Marxist uh, opponents of the regime. We're talking about the Arabs. We're talking about the Baluch. We're talking about all the anti-regime uh, uh, 
groups that are funded by foreign intelligence services, empowered by foreign intelligence services, rising up and joining this protest, fueling the protest. And it looks pretty bad. You see the demonstrations, you see the violence, people are dying. It's not a good thing. But what they don't show in the West are the days when the pro-government people take to the streets. And they literally <laughs> fill the city streets with a sea of black. Black, of course, being the pious color. And the women are wearing the job properly. The men are there. And they're in lockstep you know, support of the government. The government has far more support. And that support is, goes far deeper into Iranian society than the West maybe acknowledges. Um, I think these, this current round of um, difficulties for Iran will, um, will end in favor of the government. I don't think they're going to overthrow the government. And the timing of this is somewhat suspect, too. Why now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why now is that the Iranians are actually successfully executing a pivot to the east. The Iran nuclear agreement is, is dead. I don't think it's going to be revived. I think the United States and Europe messed up and Iran has given up and there will be no agreement. And Iran doesn't care. Because the whole thing that made that agreement work was the promise of economic interaction with Europe uh, to, to promote the Iranian economy in a sanctions-free environment. Europe has shown that it can't be anything other than America's poodle. So Europe wasn't willing to do that, which was necessary to promote this kind of interact, uh, economic interaction. Who did? Well, China stepped up to the plate last year, signed a 25-year, $400 billion deal. Russia just finalized a $40 billion deal to promote energy. Uh, Russia and, and Iran are engaged in a multi-billion dollar arms um, interaction uh, involving drones and potentially missiles. Uh, Iran has pivoted. They've joined, they're joined, they've joined BRICS. They've joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. They are firmly in the camp of the trans-Eurasian community, and their day of caring about the West is over. So these, these demonstrations are going to collapse, and I believe the Iranian regime will emerge stronger from this experience than before, because right now, the, one of the things about participating in something like this is if you were undercover, if you were hiding, if you were you know, uh, trying to blend in, you've now committed, you've now come out. The Iranian security services are some of the best in the world. They're photographing everybody, they're writing down all this stuff, and you will never be able to go back into hiding again. So all of these networks that have been created mm -hmm. since 2009 until now by foreign intelligence services are blown, they're gone. And the Iranians are going to shut them down, and then they're going to put in place mechanisms that make it more difficult to build these networks. So I think, as in most things that happen when the when Western intelligence services are involved, um, Iran's going to emerge stronger from this, and we're going to emerge weaker. Thank you, Scott. Very complicated history there. Yeah. So now I would like to ask you about situation actually is taking place in Poland. And again, you are a perfect person to ask this question because the Polish government has chosen the United States as its international partner for the construction of Poland's first nuclear power station. And I've mentioned this in my solo videos on my channel. The company that has been chosen is the Westinghouse that will build it. Um, they are starting the construction in 2026. The first reactor might be running as early as 2033. Now, as I am aware, and please correct me as if I'm wrong, that company Westinghouse, I think they were um, claiming bankruptcy after Fuk Fukushima situation. So I would like to know what are the benefits and what are the dangers of having such a nuclear power plant in Poland, Scott? The Westinghouse design um, has some issues, some safety issues over time. Uh, now Westinghouse will claim that all these have been resolved. There's no, nothing to worry about, but um, it's also uh, expensive. I think Poland's gonna be paying more money uh, for this. Uh, Poland is also, um, you know, locking themselves in. The, the United States doesn't do anything uh, that is to the benefit of Poland. They only do things that are to the benefit of the United States. So you have to look at this arrangement and understand what's in it for the United States. What does the United States get out of this? Both the United States and Russia and, and China and others are engaged in what I call atomic energy diplomacy. 
We see Russia doing it in Turkey. We see Russia doing it in Iran, where Russia is the lead uh, partner on building a nuclear power plant. But the Russians don't come in with any strings attached. It's literally, we're going to build the power plant. These are the terms. What are the strings attached to the Westinghouse deal? What, what's, what's, what does the United States want? Because it's more than just building a nuclear power plant. It's about, and, and, and the Poles know this too. I mean, this isn't like the Poles are innocent. The Poles pick the United States because they want to lure the United States into Poland as much as the United States wants to have a presence in Poland. This Correction. Is a, the Polish government that is not Polish. Okay. Stand correct. The Polish government is luring American, but then, okay, that makes it even worse because now they're, they're uh, confronting the Polish people with a fait accompli. Did the Polish people vote on wanting a permanent long-term American presence on their soil? Because this nuclear power plant is going to become a strategic piece of infrastructure that has to be secured from the evils of the Russians, especially if the Russians are going to prevail in Ukraine. So we need more American troops on Polish soil to protect this investment. This is what's going on. This is Poland being sucked in to the American orbit or Poland sucking the American orbit into, into Poland. Um, there's just, there's, when, when the United States gets involved in creating strategic infrastructure of this nature, there's always strings attached. That's the only thing I'll say. I mean, I can't, I haven't parsed this out and I can tell you exactly what the strings are. I'm just telling you, historically speaking, there's always mm -hmm. strings attached. And this is going to get the United States permanently embedded in Poland for decades to come. But we still have four more years before this construction will start. So there's hope that there, there that can be changed. Now, as far as um, any any danger from explosions or things of that nature. Well, my understanding is that Poland. Mm -hmm. Poland doesn't have an earthquake problem, so we don't have to worry about uh, about, okay. about earthquakes. Um, and Poland, uh, I, I don't, I don't know where this Westinghouse reactor is going to be sited. I, uh, is it going to be on the coast? Is it going to be inland? Um, I, I would imagine it's going to be inland. I think it's Pomorza, so I think it's more north, northern part of Poland. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't see a Fukushima type tsunami coming in mm -hmm. and, and, and impacting it. So I, I think from a, an environmental standpoint, uh, there's there's no natural disasters that are going that, that can threaten it. So it just comes down to, um, you know, is it going to be built to the proper standards, um, and are there is it going to be safely operated? Um, you know, and, and there's no reason to believe that Westinghouse won't build a quality product. I mean, it's a it's it's a well known company. Um, they, they, they are experienced in producing these reactors. I'd have to also see and go see what kind of reactor they're building because is this one of the older models or is this the newest model um, reactor? I don't know. I mean, I'm, I, I, I frankly speaking, haven't dug deep enough into this. But, I, you know, I don't want to be one of these fear mongers that sits there, oh my God, you're looking at the next Three Mile Island or Chernobyl. I don't think so. I think you're getting a nuclear power plant. And I think you're going to get a nuclear power plant that will work as advertised. Um, and will provide the amount of power generation as advertised. Uh, that's not the problem. The problem is what price is Poland paying for this beyond the price of construction? What else is Poland being called upon to do? What are the, you know, the, the spin-off costs? And I believe you're going to find those spin-off costs are going to be military in nature, involving a greater presence of American troops on the ground in Poland. There you have it. Thank you, Scott. Next fall in 2023, 20, Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO, will step down. I have two questions within one question here. The prime candidate, Christia Freeland, might be the next one to take over. First of all, I would like to know if that happens, what do you see? will be going on with NATO. And I would like to know, in your opinion, how much longer NATO will actually exist? Well, first of all, we need to understand that the Secretary General of NATO is a administrator, a civilian bureaucrat. He or she 
is not a commander. So Jan Stoltenberg or this, this, this lady from Canada um, can't pick up the phone and order the troops to advance. He doesn't have the capability. I mean, it might be his fantasy. Maybe he goes to bed dreaming tonight of uh, you know, waking up wearing a uniform and ordering troops in the battle and all this stuff. We saw he likes it. He likes to give speeches where he talks about 300,000 troops, this, that, and the other, thing, and he moves armies around an imaginary map. Uh, but then the real people, the generals and the defense ministers all go, what is he talking about? 300,000, why didn't he? <laughs> we haven't agreed to this. The real power in NATO is the military um, committee. Uh, and you know they're the ones that ultimately will, um, will, will make the critical decisions about war and peace. Uh, Stoltenberg's a political leader. Now, he has an important job to do. And uh, if this Krista girl, um, I say that, please, I'm not denigrating her. Uh, women are fully capable of taking these jobs. I, I, I'm not sitting there pretending that a woman can't do this job. A woman can do the job and maybe can do it better than John Stoltenberg or anybody else that has uh, you know, come before him. Just not her. She's a Nazi. All right. Straight up Nazi. Um, and if they promote her to this position, what does that say about the values of the NATO alliance? I mean, they're literally taking a woman who is a Nazi. Her relatives were Nazis. She's a Nazi. She supports Ukrainian white supremacy. She supports the Azov movement. I mean, really, she's somebody who should be considered for imprisonment, not promotion. But that'll come to the future of NATO. Um, but whoever becomes the Secretary General is is going to have to deal with you know some very difficult realities. Um, budgetary, first of all, uh, you know Stoltenberg tried to commit Europe to building this three hundred thousand person um, you know force of readiness. With what money? Uh, you know, really, Jan, where are you going to get the money? Uh, Europe's economy is uh, is floundering, um, so that's that's not. And where are they going to get the equipment? You know, we people talk about the two hundred thousand Russian troops. Uh, what but they don't. Scott, talk about, by the way, sorry to interrupt you. How how actually they get the money? Where the money comes from for NATO? How so they get is, it? There is no bank of NATO, so there's there's no bank of NATO that sits there and, 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 and the money comes from the individual members. 30 member states uh, set a defense budget and then um, to build their military. And then at NATO, they agree to allocate, allocate a specific percentage of their capability to NATO specific uh, functions. So uh, from well, the taxpayers. Oh yeah, no, no, by the European taxpayer, the individual yeah. country taxpayer, they don't pay a NATO tax. They pay, if I'm a German, I pay my German government to build a military and then the German government allocates a certain number of amount of that military to NATO commitments. Um, that's why, you know, when NATO was in Afghanistan, American generals had to continuously go around the different capitals uh, begging the different um, uh, nations to provide more equipment. They didn't go to NATO and say, NATO, give us more. They went to the nations and said, hey, Germany, we need you to up what you're doing. Netherlands, you need to up what you're doing. France, come on, man, get up, up what you're doing. They didn't go to NATO and say, NATO, give us more. They went to the nations because the nations control it, not NATO. And now we come to the important part of your question is what is the future of NATO? NATO as an institution, and, and this comes back, I think you're clever in your questions. This comes back to what we talked about at the very beginning, which is what is Russia's strategy for a soft landing? Um, NATO is a alliance of 30 member states and in order for this alliance to agree on something, it has to be consensus and consensus driven. Everybody has to agree, which is why, for instance, Finland and Sweden aren't NATO members yet, because one NATO member, Turkey, has said, Hayir, that's Turkish for no, it ain't going to happen. Yolk, um, more Turkish stuff. I lived in Turkey for a little while, so I'm showing off my 40 year old memory. But, uh, but the. Uh, Turkish the, sub subscribers hit like. <laughs> Turkish subscribers. <laughs> Donor kebab, uh, but the um, the you know Turkey said no. The, the The fact of the matter is, this European crisis that we're seeing right now uh, is going to have an impact on NATO. It's going to impact how the nations can support NATO and what NATO activities they're willing to support. Right now, the United States, because of the Polish issue, there's a lot of focus right now on Poland, uh, not Polish issue, Ukrainian issue, on Poland on Romania, on Hungary, Czech Republic, the Baltics, the nations that border Ukraine. 
But what about Germany? What about France? What about Italy? What about Spain? What about Portugal? What about Turkey? What about these other NATO members? The United Kingdom. I mean, it's it's it was meant to be funny, but it's true. The entire British army cannot fill a European soccer stadium. Think about it. The entire British army cannot fill a good-sized European soccer stadium. Let's say you have a stadium that's designed to hold 110,000 people. There's 72,000 people in the British army. Oh my goodness, how is that even? <laughs> so, well, and that's pretty much the rest of Europe too. The rest of Europe is weak, 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 weak. Yeah. In order to become strong, they have to spend a lot of money and invest in resources. Now, is Russian policy, now we come back to that very cleverly orchestrated question of yours. Russian, what, what is Russia's objective? To create the conditions in which NATO is motivated to invest heavily in their military and deploy this military towards the east to confront Russia. Is that Russia's real objective? Is that what Russia wants? Or does Russia want to sit down with Europe, inclusive of NATO, to figure out how to create a new European security framework that deconflicts Russia with Europe? That instead of increasing the number of troops on the border, pushes them back, brings it down. I think Russia has made it clear they want the new European security framework. So they have to manage this NATO problem. That's the other reason why they have to be careful about what they're doing in Ukraine. I keep hearing people saying, why would Russia negotiate? Everybody in the West is talking about a negotiation. Why would Putin negotiate? Well, first of all, Putin is only going to negotiate, finalize a negotiation uh, on terms that are acceptable to Russia. The notion that he's going to be dictated terms like leave Crimea, leave the Donbass, pay reparations, turn people over, including yourself to The Hague for war crimes, whatever, isn't going to happen. But now Putin can say, I refuse to have any negotiations. We cut all doors. And in doing so, alienate Europe. And you breathe fire into the fear factor. Now, Europe is really afraid of Russia because Russia is unreasonable. Russia won't negotiate. Mm -hmm. Putin says, we're open to negotiation anytime. We want a negotiation. Uh, we're willing to work with you on a negotiation. What do you guys want to do? Let's negotiate. He's creating an environment that is negotiation friendly that hopefully carries over from the Russian military victory in Ukraine to a dialogue with Europe about the new European security framework. That's Russia's number one priority. Uh, it can't be done without resolving the U Ukraine thing. But remember, Russia was trying to do that without invading Ukraine. So it's not like Russia said, we have to invade Ukraine to get this. Russia was willing to sit down and talk about a new European security framework without invading Ukraine. So, you know, let's see what Russia does. I mean, I, again, because I, I, don't, I don't sit in with, I know contrary to popular belief, I'm not really the Russian agent everybody thinks I am. Um, I, I don't get off the phone every morning with a good friend, Vlad, and, uh, and, and, and you know, secretly advise him on what to do. I have no idea what's going on in his head. Now, that's not true, because historically speaking, Russian leaders tend to say things that they mean. So if you listen to Putin, and you listen to what he says, um, you get sort of an insight. And it took Ray McGovern, an old CIA hand, uh, who used to brief, uh, you know, vice presidents and secretaries of state on uh, on the, the intelligence. Uh, he said, you know, he, he was one of the lead analysts in the in the CIA back in the day, in the 70s, 60s and 70s, about Soviet issues. And he said, you know, 80 percent of what we did was just read Soviet newspapers, hmm. open source. Simple and, as that, huh? <laughs> Simple as that, really. Well, but then you have to, but then you have to understand mm -hmm. how to read it. That was the key. How do you read it? And he said, "What you know?" So our job was to read it and then read other things and try and understand what was being said. And he said, most of the time, what was being said was exactly what was being said. I Meaning there were no secrets. It was that was it right there. You just. You, and he said, "Okay." So he listened to Putin uh, speak at the Valdai uh, conference, and Putin spoke about Odessa. And I don't have the benefit of the, all the. The, the exact quotes, but the, the thing about Odessa, a, a reporter, I believe from Hungary, asked mm -hmm. a question about, um, should I visit Odessa? And yep. I remember that, yep. Mm -hmm. short, short answer was uh, soon. 
it better if you visit it sooner rather than later, implying something might be happening. But then when he talked about Odessa, he said, um, Odessa could be a point of disruption or a, a, a vehicle for solving problems, meaning that Odessa is far more important than people think, meaning that Odessa is on his mind, meaning that Odessa is going to sort of define uh, the end of this conflict, meaning that Odessa is on the table. And if I were the Ukrainians and the Americans and the Brits, I'd be sitting there going, holy cow, Putin is basically saying, I don't have to invade Odessa, that there could be a solution that allows this conflict to end with Ukraine retaining an outlet to the ocean, which means Ukraine will remain economically viable, that Ukraine will be a viable national state. Because the solution, other than that, is that Russia sweeps through you, uh, Odessa and takes Transnistria. Now, from, the Rus from my perspective, that's what I think the Russians should do. Because I'm like, how can you leave 400,000 people hanging in Transnistria? Uh, Odessa is a Russian city. You have 200,000 troops coming in. Take the darn place, link it up, solve your problems. But that's short-sighted thinking by an idiot American sitting in his chair thousands of miles removed from the problem, thinking that he's Zhukov. Okay? No. There's people like Putin who actually have responsibility, command responsibility for a nation, who's sitting there saying, we got to figure out how to have a soft landing for Europe. And you don't get a soft landing for Europe by rubbing their face in the mud. And taking Odessa is rubbing their face in the mud because what you're doing is permanently disabling Ukraine. And think about that. Well, it may feel good as a Russian to say, ha, 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 we showed those, ho, ho, you know, we showed them, ha, rump state, <laughs> agriculture, no sea. Oh, okay, but now 10 years from now, Russia's going, that's a festering wound. Uh, it's, an, it's infected and it's, you know, we're all getting sepsis. This is a disaster. How do we solve that? Well, we can't give them Odessa because we took Odessa. Um, and Europe's in there going, we have no solution. And it's just a cancer. Ukraine becomes a cancer. So if you truly care about Russia and Europe and European security, you sit there and say, how can we end this so that Ukraine remains a viable nation state? that Europe doesn't feel threatened by overbearing Russian aggressiveness, and we create the conditions that allow us to sit down and negotiate a European security framework. See, I think the Russians are on that page. I don't know, but I think they are because it makes sense. It's consistent with their policies. And Putin just told us, people in the West, we, <laughs> the funny thing, I go to America. Putin spoke at the uh, Valdaica, what? The Valdeca, what's that? It's this thing he does every year. Where? Well, sometimes in Sochi, sometimes in Moscow. Sochi, what, what's Sochi? It's a city on the Black Sea. Black Sea, where's the Black Sea? I mean, just stupidity like that. Instead of going, yep, I follow Valdai. It's very important. I mean, think about it. what we're talking about right now. The, the Odessa comments were made because a lot of people just read his initial address. Yes. And it's, they go, yes. Oh, anything there is a sort. No, no, this isn't the four hour question and answer period mm -hmm. that followed. Mm -hmm. uh, where mm -hmm. all the important stuff was said. And you got to listen to what he says. This is the lesson that Ray McGovern has given all of us. If you want to think like a CIA analyst, successful CIA analyst, stop talking about secret information, rumors, speculation. Listen to the words spoken by the principal and understand what's being said. Putin doesn't speak idly. Yes, he has a sense of humor. Yes, he can tell a joke. Yes, he, but everything he says, Words matter. So everything he said about Odessa matters. Listen to what he said. And if anybody out there who's listening to this is in a position to advise people, pick up the phone and call them and say, Putin has opened the door to a European solution. And it hinges on Odessa. How do we get the Ukrainians to accept the peace that allows them to retain Odessa while losing everything else. They're not going to get this other stuff back. It's not on the table. But what Ukraine gets is continued national economic viability. Because if they don't accept it, they become this festering one. What Europe gets is a Ukraine capable of eventually sustaining itself, rebuilding, 
becoming a self-sustaining nation state that could join the European Union down the road as a responsible member or become what part of whatever the future European community is going to be. You know, I think the European Union, like NATO, is on the checkout lane. But And this, what I would like to know before you end this here on this, what is the future and the soft landing for NATO? Is there ending to NATO? And if there is, how this will come to fruition? Well, let's put it this way. NATO has no historical viability, meaning uh, history. There's no reason for NATO to exist. Mm -hmm. So when you project down the road, there's nothing that's going to happen that says NATO is going to be here in 20 years. Um, the question is, how do we get to that 20 year? What path do we take? I think the path the Russians want to take is a negotiated European security framework that makes NATO superfluous. Because a European security framework means, means now that Europe needs to talk about the things that Macron and others have been talking about, which is a European security organization that doesn't include the United States. And look, both Germany and France are waking up to the fact that America is a problem. You hear them saying, you know, what are you doing with gas prices? How come you're stealing our industries? I mean, they're, they're starting to sanction the Americans for the nonsense that's going on right now. They're recognizing America is the problem. And it's not just economic, it's military. America is dictating a military reality to Europe that doesn't have to exist. They didn't need to go into Ukraine. They didn't need to create this war. Now they had. And now what is the solution? The American solution is for Europe to bankrupt itself and build this giant army that cannot be sustained. So what, is NATO going to go the American route, build this military, and then you're going to see this very awkward collapse. You're going to see decades of conflict, not war, but Cold War-like conflict between uh, NATO and Russia. But the difference is, the last time the Cold War ended, it was Russia, the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact that collapsed. This time, it's going to be NATO and Europe that collapses because it's unsustainable. You can't build up what they're talking about. And it's going to be the United States that's going to be negotiating an awkward withdrawal from Poland and all that. And the Polish people are going to pay the price because now you're going to have chaos and anarchy and you may get a government you don't want. You may become part of a larger Russian, Belarusian, Ukraine uh, security federation. Do you really want that again? Uh, because once America starts withdrawing and there's nothing in Europe to stand up to, you're going to be left alone. And you're going to have to make a decision that says we're going to have to pivot east. I know there's all those you, you, you create, uh, Polish nationalists, never, never, never. In 30 years, dude, you're going to be dead. I'm going to be dead. You know, we don't matter in 30 years. In 30 years, there's going to be a new reality, a new generation of Polish leaders who are going to be looking at something you can't even begin to comprehend right now, which is a collapsed Europe, a collapsed NATO, an America in retreat, and you're left alone hanging. You are going to go to Russia unless you work now to negotiate a European security framework that allows Poland to be part of the European Union economically, but not linked to the United States militarily to create a European security framework that recognizes Europe's collective security interests without turning Poland into an armed military camp. Because that's what Poland's about to become, an armed military camp. You don't want that. It's not good for anybody. All it will do is destroy your society, destroy your economy, because the focus now is going to become military in nature. Everything's going to be driven by your NATO commitment, your NATO commitment, your NATO commitment. The whole world isn't focusing on NATO anymore. The whole world is focusing on this multipolarity. And it would be nice if Poland could become part of the multipolarity instead of allowing itself to be tied up as part of this stupid American singularity that includes a compliant NATO in Europe that does whatever we want it to do. So yes. the path towards the demise of NATO is either going to be the hard path, which is mm -hmm. to turn Poland into an unsustainable military uh, camp until the moment that Europe and Poland collapses under the weight of the, you know, the, the, the lunacy of what they had created, similar to what happened to the Warsaw Pact in the Soviet Union in 19, from 1989 to 1991, or, or a negotiated soft landing that allows Poland to be what Poland wants, independent of Russian influence, focused on being 
a member of a larger European community and with an economy that serves Polish sovereign interests, not the interests of their American masters. That's the other path you can take to the buys of NATO, because what's going to happen in that path is there's going to be a point in time where Europe gathers NATO and says, we pin medals on everybody. We thank you very much. But NATO is going to end and the new European security agency or alliance is going to emerge in its place. That's what I hope happens. And I think that's what the Russians want. The Russians, you know, the Russians aren't demanding the dissolution of NATO. The Russians do point out that there's no, really no reason for NATO to exist. But Russia doesn't want to um, you know, foment a, a, a situation that um, has NATO becoming this expansive militaristic organization solely focused on containing Russia. Um, because while NATO is doing that, guess what Russia has to do? Respond. So they have to spend all that money, build all this stuff up at a time when they don't need that. They yeah. need to be focused on this trans-Eurasian economic union thing that they got going. Um, so I think the Russian diplomats right now are working to give Europe the opportunity for a soft landing while they prepare for the potential of a decisive victory. And the, the problem with Europe is at some point, Putin's going to pull the trigger on that 200,000 man army that they're building up. And that trigger may be heading straight through Odessa. And that means nobody listened to what Putin said in Valdai. Putin literally opened the door for peace. The West just needs to step through the threshold and show itself to be sufficient to the challenge. Scott, what is it like to be a veteran now in the United States? Yeah, that's an individual question. I mean, uh, it, it all comes down to, um, I think, your current status, where, where you are in your life. Um, then how you relate where you are to, you know, your your experience in the military. Um, I, I've made no bones about it. My time in the Marine Corps was some of the finest moments of my entire life. I mean, I I was challenged like I've never been challenged before. Uh, I, I was up to the challenge. I excelled, did very well. I mean, I am very proud of my record. I'll put it up against anybody. Uh, I was a good Marine. I was a damn good Marine. Um, and I proved myself in, in war. I proved myself in peace. I proved myself in, in conditions of Cold War. I succeeded at everything I did in the Marine Corps. I never failed. I mean, I, I lieutenants always fail. <laughs> we always make mistakes. But I was, I, was, I was given the privilege of having leaders that allowed me to learn from my mistake uh, and not, not ruin my career or crush my ambition because of mistakes. Uh, I learned from every mistake I made. And I succeeded in the end. I, I helped the Marine Corps be a better corps. I played a role in, in, in turning the Marine Corps into what it is today, the world's finest fighting force, hands down. Nobody can touch us on the field of battle. My advice to anybody is don't try. Don't take up the challenge because it won't end well. Um, but, you know, in, in the, and I have to tell you, the Marine Corps gave me the opportunities I have. I mean, um, first of all, the, the leadership skills I learned. Uh, while at the battalion level and brigade level. Um, later on, was on the United, when I was in the United Nations, you know, the first thing that, that happened is there was a leadership vacuum. I mean, ask mm -hmm. yourself, how does a 30-year-old snot-nosed, you know, junior captain type guy rise up to be a chief weapons inspector who's running around the world meeting with national leaders, talking these big issues? <laughs> I was just a Marine captain. But Marines abhor a vacuum. And when you walk into a situation and it begs for leadership, it begs for initiative, and nobody's taking the initiative, you know what Marines do? They step up and they take control. They step up and say, I'll do the job. Are you qualified? Hell no. But I'm doing it anyways because it's a job that needs to be done. You know how you become an expert? Not by going to college and getting a PhD. You become an expert by being the first person to do something. Because once you've done it, nobody else has done it. You're the expert. And uh, that's been my experience. Not because I'm better than anybody, not because I'm smarter than anybody, because I tell you right now, I'm not. The fact is, there's Marines who are stronger than me. There's Marines who are faster than me. There's Marines who shoot better than me. They lift more weights. They're a hell of a lot better looking in uniform than I am, um, you know, and all that. But they didn't accomplish what I accomplished because they're 
experience in Marine Corps took them down a different path. I was given the extraordinary opportunity as a lieutenant to work in a major's billet, implementing arms control in the Soviet Union, even though my language was insufficient, my education was insufficient, everything about me was insufficient, but because I took the initiative and said, send me, I'll do it. And when I got there, I did it. And in doing so, I became the expert. And that means that the next time it needed to be done, they said, bring in the expert. And if you do it twice and nobody's done it, you're twice the expert as anybody. Next thing you know, you're emerging there as the expert. And you don't know why, because you're still the dumb idiot you were when you started. It's just that you've accumulated some experiences that allowed you to grow at a faster rate. Then they sent me to war. I mean, I know what I wanted to do in the war. I didn't get to do that. I got to do something completely different. And um, in the same thing. There's a vacuum. I mean, I, I, short war story, if you got time. I mean, it's not, it's not the best war you story. Know, you know, but, I have asked you also this question because mm -hmm. I don't know how it is really um, in the U.S. When I lived there, I remember on Veterans Day, I had this feeling that maybe I'm wrong, but that government didn't really care much about those who... Oh, no, you're, 100, you're 100 percent correct but this is why okay i won't tell the war story we'll go back because it was <laughs> going down the wrong path thank you for stopping me um the, the 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 thing is my experience on veterans day is a personal experience mm -hmm. i personally had a great time in the military i personally attribute my experiences in the military into me being what i'm able to do today um talk about these issues with you to have the background that gives me the competence to talk about these issues and all that. And so on Veterans Day, I sit back and I say, wow, thank you, America, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Marine Corps, for giving me this opportunity. You know, I'm proud to be a veteran. I'm proud to have served my country. But it's not like I'm going down to the VFW or, or, or the American Legion and walking in and there's going to be a bunch of us sitting there linking arms and singing songs and drinking beer. Um, the closest thing to a reunion I'm going to get is coming up on December 8th, where I'm going to go to Washington, D.C., and uh, we're going to have the 35th anniversary of the signing of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. And all the veterans of that treaty are going to get together. And then that night, we're going to have an infamous poker game. And if you read my book, you understand how important poker is mm -hmm. for a weapons mm -hmm. inspector. And mm -hmm. I'm going to give people money for free because I'm a horrible poker player. But we're going to have that veteran experience. But today, as we speak, down the road is a VA hospital. And in that hospital are old veterans. There's, there's fewer and fewer of the World War II guys. They're dying out. They're a dying breed. There's some Korean guys in there, a lot of Vietnam guys, but increasingly a lot of guys from the Gulf War um, and from uh, the more current wars, Iraq and Afghanistan, people with substance abuse, people with PTSD, people who were wounded and abandoned. Um, you know, and on, on Veterans Day, this is a day where you know, if society really meant it, we'd all be going there yes. and throwing a party for these guys. And I'm not saying to artificially, and when I say a party, I don't mean it has to be, but you know, to the guy that's just laying in bed alone, hold his hand, talk to him, tell him a story. If he's capable, listen to his story. You know, to the, the guy with PTSD, just sit there and hug him. Well, you do it, Scott, right? You go there. I, I have. I don't, yeah. I, you know, I, you know I, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's tough to do by yourself because it's emotional. Yeah. I mean, there's only, there's only so much you can give before you totally break yourself and drain yourself. And I'm going to be frank with you. This whole stupid Russian war is draining me like you've never, nothing's drained me in, in times. There's a, there's a huge intellectual commitment to it. There's a time commitment, yes. uh, physically draining. I mean, um, and it's emotionally draining because you become vested in the problem, not the solution per se, because again, I'm an American, so I can't sit here and say rah, rah, Russia or rah, rah, Ukraine. I do say bye, bye, Nazi. Uh, but other than that, you know, I'm just simply trying to look at the, the, the situation and, and talk about potential outcomes. If I thought Ukraine was going to win this war, I would say straight up, I think Ukraine is going to win it. I was honest when Ukraine received the billions of dollars. I said, this is a game changer. This is going to breathe new life into Ukrainian military. It's going to make the conflict much more difficult for Russia. It's going to require Russia to increase the number of resources. That doesn't mean that I was 
pro-Ukraine, anti-Russia. I was just calling it as the situation was. But, you know, you, 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 you do this and there's other people out there who have taken sides and they always will find something wrong with your argument, which is OK. But at one point in time, to, I mean, it just becomes draining on you. Like yes. Constantly <laughs> dealing with this stuff. And so, you know, today, I mean, what I should have done today is turn off my damn computer. Yeah. Not have this interview with you, not have the three interviews I had before this, not have the one I'm going to have after this, not write the article I wrote this morning, not write the article that I'm going to write this afternoon and just sleep in, eat a great breakfast and then go to the VA and just walk from room to room to room. To room. And now I feel guilty. No, don't. I'm just saying <laughs> that, um, you know, the problem is life happens. So even here, I'm sitting here saying that things should be done. I'm not living up to that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm committed to life. And you say, well, this is important. Scott. Well, you know, everybody else who's committed to life is important too. Their lives matter. Their, you know, the pressures they feel from, from life matters. It's hard to celebrate your veterans properly because to do so, you have to be totally unselfish. And there's not a single person among us that is totally unselfish. We think we're doing things for noble reasons, but it's still a selfish thing because we're doing it about us and for us. To do something like that, you know, I have a standing invitation from a, a guy, and I'm going to take him up on it. So I'm glad we had this conversation. I'm going to call him up. There's a, a retirement home uh, in town, and uh, there's a lot of um, veterans there, not just military veterans, veterans of foreign service and all that. And they, he says they always talk about me. So I'm going to go over there, and I'm going to let them talk about themselves. And uh, do, I, I won't be able to do it today, but I'm going to call him up today because of this conversation. So Bill Vincent, you. if you're listening... <laughs> Expect my call, buddy. You know, and uh, <laughs> Michelle Sanchez, she's a nurse at the VA. Hey, Michelle, let's get in touch. I need to get over there again, talk to these guys. So. That's great. Happy Veterans Day. Happy Veterans Day. Thank you, Scott, so much for today. I have two more things to mention. One is, okay, so I, I will tell you a story. There is this Polish journalist who is absolutely my favorite. His name is Maciej Maciak. No BS, tells it like it is, intelligent, smart, on point, following things. And he mentioned, <laughs> he mentioned you several times, but what really, because I wanted to talk to him on my channel as well, didn't happen. It's okay, no offense. But I was one um, video he did, and he mentioned during this video about your Twitter post, the one when you returned to Twitter about Bucha. Yeah. And I said, oh my goodness. So here is Scott Ritter, who is my guest. And here is this person who I so appreciate because to find independent, honest, um, with a backbone, journalists, okay, in Poland. Yes, you can, but this man is like for real. So I just want to, if he's watching right now, I just want to give a huge shout out to Maciej Maciak because I learn a lot about Polish um, dynamics and realities and shenanigans thanks to him. And I know that he mentioned you several times. I just want to say it here a little bit. This is a selfish moment right now. That's okay. <laughs> it's good to be selfish but, sometimes. <laughs> but he, I know that he mentioned you and that was really interesting for me to watch that. And Scott, uh, let me ask you about your book, The Disarmament in Times of Perestroika, Arms Control and the End of the Soviet Union, which is right behind Scott. The links down below this video as always. As you said to me before we start recording, this book might be translated in Russian, correct? That is correct. Well, it's being translated in it's Russian. It's being translated, yeah. yes. And then we cannot really give the audience the time frame now, but we will definitely announce it as soon as it's ready. So, yeah, let me see what, what time it will be ready, right? Not, not that much longer, right, you think? Well, I hope not, but I mean, I'm not in control. Look, the, the people that are doing this are doing this. Um, I'm sure they have their, you know, their vested interest. Nothing's done for free, but they took the initiative. They're doing this free of charge um, to help promote uh, my story, the book in Russia. So um, I think it's incumbent that I let them do it um, at their pace. Uh, they, you know, they, you know, it, it yes. doesn't do me any good to become impatient. Uh, it'll happen when it happens. 
they want to do a very good job. I guess the way the you know the book is written in um, American English, <laughs> so there's a lot of nuance and and things that need to be accurately captured, uh, you know, through translation, uh, mm -hmm. so that it doesn't you know, so that it, you you make sure it's saying the right thing that you're capturing the emotion and the spirit of the of the book. So I, I think they brought in some of the best uh, linguists out there who are working on this. Uh, on this project. So hopefully when the book does come out in Russia, it'll be a book that accurately reflects what I was trying to, the story I was trying to tell. Perfect. Meanwhile, you can get it in English and you will find the links down below. And Scott, so people can find you on Telegram, Twitter. No, I'm not on Twitter anymore. I've been banned from Twitter. When that happened? Uh, 24 hours after I sent that tweet that your uh, Polish journalist friend was talking about. Oh my goodness. The test, test, okay. test tweet. Elon Musk failed the test. <laughs> There's no free speech on Twitter, uh, so you know I'm I'm banned. He, you know, we're waiting for the content uh, panel, oh. I guess, to do this. Okay. So not that, but I am on. Um, I, I did create a. When I say I, I, I can't take credit for it. Uh, Jeff Norman, who runs the uh, the Ask the Inspector podcast, um, is a very good good friend, and he's a he's a good manager, and he has created. Uh, a, a website, uh, scottritterextra.com. And on that, you will find every okay. video that I get. So for instance, when you when we finish here and you send me a link, mm -hmm. um, I put that video on my Telegram, but he also puts it on the scottritterextra.com so people can access this. There's no paywall. Everything is free. Boom. I have a sub stack that's linked to that. And I write art I wrote two articles in the last 24 hours. Uh, that are posted there. And again, the articles can be, there, there's no paywall. Um, however, if you are so inclined, uh, there is ability to donate to the cause uh, on that. And the, the cause is twofold. One, uh, you enable Jeff and uh, Tori, his, uh, his, his cohort, or, or the producer of the show, to uh, continue to do their work. I mean, it'd be nice to be able to do, you know, live life and not worry about income, but you know, when they contribute the hours that they're contributing, that they need an income stream. Uh, it also helps me out with a, with with a with an income stream. Um, you know, again, I'm not complaining, but you know, the reality is, I did. Uh, what it's what time is it now in, in New York? It's 1:39. I have done one, two, three, four. I've done five hours of interviews today. Um, I had to get up early to spend three hours writing an article. So I've already had an eight hour work day today. That doesn't include the hour I took to go walk my dogs. So, um, you know, and I've got more to come. I made the choice to do this. I made the choice to do this, but a lot of what I do is free. Like, the, you know, the, the, I don't charge mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. Whatever pay. Uh, but the point is, if, if people think that this is valuable, just like the, the work that you do, if people think the work you do is valuable, then they should... Um, they should contribute to help you continue to do your work. And so the vehicle to do that with me is through the Substack. Again, it's purely voluntary. Uh, you don't have to do it. You get access to everything. But scottritterextra.com is the... Uh, okay, okay. scottritterextra.com and by purchasing your books as well. Oh, you help me a lot when you purchase my book. I keep telling people, you know, this is the best book I've ever written. I asked the author, he said so. And... Um, <laughs> It makes the perfect Christmas gift. I mean, we got the holiday season coming up, and why yeah. not buy a copy for every member of your family? Um, <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, it is a look. If I could give the book away for free, I would. Um, it's a book I think should be read, and I'm being dead serious right now. It's a it's an important part of our history, uh, and it provides a message of hope for how we could possibly get out of this current uh, fiasco that is U.S. Russian relations. We we proved we could do it once before. We can do it again if we put our minds to it. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. The wheel's already been built. Um, and this book give, it empowers you. I always use that phrase, knowledge is power. Well, it is. And this book will empower you with knowledge so that you can better address these issues and feel, feel more confident because fear is derived from ignorance. You're afraid of mm -hmm. that which you do not know. So if you empower yourself with knowledge and information, you will no longer be afraid. And living in this world, um, free of fear is a good way to live mm, so true and they controlled us by fear so oh yeah, oh, yeah. here is the answer scott Putin. sincerely Putin. are you afraid 
Putin, are you afraid? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yeah, well, you know, this or the other, right? Yeah. Uh, m actually, miraculously, Putin cured the um, last two years of the disease. The pandemic? Just cured it. Boom, done, Pff, gone. So Putin I for just the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> yeah, I just want to thank you really.